of HIV infection and uh, preventive tools. What about the epidemiology of HIV? It is first recognized in 1981, though the earliest documented case of HIV infection has been traced to a blood sample from the Democratic, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo in 1959. In 2015, it was estimated that there was 36.7 million people living with HIV or AIDS. So regions have marked differences in HIV prevalence, incidence, and the dominant mode of transmission. So there are multiple regions in the world that have, that have differences in the HIV prevalence, incidence, and the dominant mode of transmission. <clears throat> So, uh, according to the figures raised by the World Health Organization, most of the world that harbor HIV infection raised in Africa, and about 2.5.7 million. So Africa has the largest uh, region, the largest portion of the global HIV epidemic, uh, followed by Southeast Asia, which is about 3.8 million. Then 3.5 lies in the Americas, uh, South and uh, Northern Americas, followed by Eastern Mediterranean, then the lowest region around in the Western Pacific. So these are the figures raised by WHO in 2018. So HIV has had a devastating impact in the Africa especially in the Sub-Saharan Africa. <clears throat> in the Middle East, uh, it, is, uh, still, it is low incidence, it is no trial incidence in comparison to the Sub-Saharan Africa. What about the epidemiology of HIV infection in Iraq? Indeed, it is considered a country with a low level of epidemic of HIV or AIDS, which affects most at-risk population groups. So, the risk, at-risk population groups, these are the liable to get the HIV infection. The prevalence is currently, according to the WHO, is less than 0.1% of the population. Up to 2014, the figures raised by the WHO, less than 100 people living with HIV were reported. So, these are the reported cases, the underreported. So, Iraq is underreporting the HIV infection. On of the reported cases, 57% were infected by the dominant, dominantly by the blood transfusion and blood products. So most of the cases in Iraq acquire HIV infection by blood products or transfusion of blood and its related products. And nowadays become this mode of transmission all will become uncommon. Why? Do you have any idea why the uh, acquiring HIV infection through blood or blood products become uncommon. So if you can write in the chat, so can I see your answers? Although, although it is highly sensitive, but it's not 100%. You still may get a uh, contracted uh, this virus from the blood. Although nowadays it's become very rare. So, a history of blood transfusion will not eliminate 100% the risk of transmission. epidemiology of HIV in Iraq. So, we'll go through the viral structure of the HIV. Uh, I know you take the virology and this year, so you'll get details, description of the virus. So each mature viral has a lipid membrane. These are the lipid membrane. And this is the lipid membrane has been studied with various proteins, most important of which is the GP glycoprotein 120 and the glycoprotein 41. Okay. The glycoprotein 41, this is a very important one. And the glycoprotein 120, this one. Okay, yeah, so this is the, the, the GP41. This is the GP. GP means it, Black protein, okay, GP20, 120, 120 and 41. These are the important proteins. 
And the inner core of the inner core of this is another protein, P24. This is very important protein. Why? Because most of the diagnostic tools will depend on the presence of these proteins or glycoproteins in the blood. The viral genome which consists of two uh, strands of the RNA and the various enzymes, for example, reverse transcriptase, okay, and the protease. So there is a lipid membrane, a matrix studied with various proteins, inner core of P24, the viral genome, and the viral enzymes. So these are a brief description of each mature virion. This is this will demonstrate that under electron microscopy the appearance of virus at the stage of entry to the cell. So if you notice that these are the spikes of various proteins that are going to fuse with the cell that harbor specific receptors. So the HIV, the human deficiency virus, will not enter to any cell because it needs some receptors to mediate its transmission and fusion with these cells. Okay. What about the types of HIV infection? As you know, there are two main types of HIV, the HIV-1 and the HIV-2. Which is more common, the HIV-1 or the HIV-2 virus? Any idea which is more prevalent? HIV or the HIV two? Any idea? Do you have any get an answer? Madas Maasat Life, Shunu Lafu. One. HIV one, okay. Any other answers? So no answer except for except for you. HIV one is more prevalent than HIV two. Okay. What are the subtypes of HIV one? HIV one, human deficiency virus type one, have subtypes M type, O type, and N type. The M type the, is the major type, it has gone the worldwide distribution. And this type has gone subtypes of nine subtypes A through D, F through H, and J and K. So these are the main the worldwide distribution, the M major type, the O, the outlier type, and the N, non major and outlier between the two. Okay, these are the types and subtypes of HIV. So we have get HIV1 and HIV2, HIV1 have three subtypes, the M, O, and N. The M has got three or nine subtypes, sorry, nine subtypes. These are important from the methodological uh, perspectives, rather than treatment perspectives. So, any idea about how that virus transmitted? Do you know any uh, modes of transmission? So the mode of transmission, first of all, the sexual transmission, the sexual contact, which is by far the most common mode of transmission worldwide. Uh, the risk of sexual transmission depends on the number of partners, the higher the partner, the, li the likely the risk of uh, acquisition transmission, the type of act, whether it is receptive or insertive, the presence of other ulcerating sexual transmitted infections, why? how this will affect the, the risk of transmission. Why the presence of ulcerating cell? Do you have any idea? The presence of other ulcerating sexual transmitted infections. Do you have any idea about the, why the presence of other ulcerating? And for example, the patient has uh, syphilis or gonorrhea. 
why it will affect the risk of transmission in comparison to patients with none of these infections. Because the presence of these infections will promote inflammation and will get recruitment of more cells that are vulnerable to entry by the virus. So when there is an inflammation created by these infections, it will promote large number of cells that are the targets for the entry of the virus. So it will facilitate the transmission of the virus rapidly in comparison to patients with none of these infections. So I mean, the presence of an inflammation will promote cells that are the target of the HIV. The stage of illness of an infected partner, so the, the patient who have yet the end stage of HIV, they will have, have, have high viral load and high dose of the virus during sexual contact and the virulence of the virus. So the virulence of the virus, we have HIV-1 and HIV-2. The HIV-1 is more virulent than the HIV-2, and so the risk of transmission will be more. So this is in respect to the sexual contact. So these are the factors that affect the risk of transmission. So the number of partners, type of act, presence of other STI, yani sexual transmitted infections, stages of the illness, which is an early stage or the later stage, and the virulence of the virus. Worldwide, keep in your mind that the major of transmission is heterosexual. What about the other parenteral type is recognized as also one of the most common types of transmission through contaminated blood and blood products. The risk is, uh, reach, may reach to 90% of large quantities infused in the bloodstream. So the patient gets an infected blood find so the risk is very high, 90%. What about the needle-stick injury that are encountered in the medical, in the hospitals, in the medical personnel? It is regarded as low risk, and, uh, and it's uh, about 0.3%. And every three from 1,000 medical personnel will get this infection, so it is low risk. And I'm not I will loss. الأطباء أو الممرضين أو الكادر الطبي يعني لا تحرض إلى هذا نيد ريسك إنجري فروم بيشنت إنفكتد إذا اتش أي في بيشنت ذا ريسك إز أباوت 0.3 بيرسنت دراج أبيوزرز سو إت إز هاي ريسك واي هاي ريسك بيكوز أوف هاي فريكونسي أند نيدل شيرنج هذا دائما كل ساعة تشوف نفسه ثاني هاي نيدل ممكن ماي بي شيرد باي هيز بارتنرز سو ذا ريسك إز هاي بيكوز أوف فريكونسي هاي فريكونسي أند نيدل شيرنج باي أول سو إت ويل جيت a very large inoculum. Other modes in the parental uh, utility, including skin piercing, tattooing, acupuncture, uh, tattooing acupuncture, acupuncture, ear piercing with contaminated needles. Then contaminated needles are not important. Yeah, and tattooing with contaminated needles raise the risk of transmission. <clears throat> so this is the parental mode of transmission. إذا عندكم سؤال طلاب لحد الآن بالنسبة للبارنترال مود اوف ترانزميشن؟ بس دكتور بالنسبة لسالفة 90% ريسك يعني ممكن انه واحد ياخذ بلاد ترانزفيوجن من شخص مصاب بدون ما يصير به؟ يس بس ات از رير 10% 90% will acquire from from 10 patients 9 will acquire the virus and 1 will not acquire it so it is rare most of the patients will acquire the risk will acquire the virus, most of the patients, 90%. Dr. Basul, I'm sorry, the hijama is the doctor. How do you get rid of the HIV? If the blood vacuum instrument, if it is shared between the patients, nowadays they are become more sophisticated and disposable. So each patient will get, each person will get its own blood vacuum. So there is no risk. Of a transmission, but but if it is shared, and if the hand of the person that doing this blood vacuum is contaminated by other patient, not uh, well sterilized, not under sterilized, it may it may increase the risk of transmission. So it depends on the technique, rather than its one. But previously, no, because it is shared between. I have said, تقريبا مثل drug abusers, because it is shared between the. But nowadays, uh, to become a disposable instrument, each person will get its own blood vacuum.
فاحنا لو واحد عنده مسوي حجامه لازم نسال وات ذا تايب اوف اندر ستيريلايز تكنيكس اور نوت اوكي مو مو كلهم يسوون مو كلهم يسوون هاي الامور يعني ترى فات ستيل هاربر ذا ريسك اف ات از نوت دن اندر ستيريلايز تكنيك شكرا دكتور عفوا بعد اكو سؤال بالنسبه للبارنترال ترانزميشن Okay. What about the other mode or the third mode of transmission? The vertical mode. These are the approximate figures uh, that come for the risk of transmission. What about the transplacental and around 20%? The peripartum, 80%, and the lactation, 0.5% per month. Okay. So during pregnancy, 20%, peripartum during delivery, um, can reach this is high risk, 80%. Lactation confer 0.5 percent per month. So this is a cumulative. So lactation is going to also increase the risk of transmission. So how you can prevent this uh, transmission of the virus from the owner to the fetus? And keep in your mind that HIV inf infected child progress rapidly to AIDS because of immune suppression, because of decreased immunity when it is acquired early in life. So how you can prevent it? By early institution to the mother and to the uh, born baby born fetus, uh, baby born child, sorry, by doing the antiretroviral drugs, especially for the mother, refraining from the breastfeeding and to decrease the peripartum Transmission, you have to do a cesarean delivery. Cesarean delivery is going to decrease the risk, but not eliminate it. So these are the preventive, very important. You have to focus on these preventive tools to prevent the uh, transmission of the virus from the mother to the its fetus. Well, you know how you can prevent? HIV infection, the vertical mode of transmission. So, what about the other body fluids, milk, saliva, urine, tears, may contain the virus, especially if mixed of blood. Especially if mixed with the blood. Okay? But these, uh, on its own, these fluids are uh, confer very low risk for transmission, tears, saliva, uh, urine, okay? So we have an examples of the mode of transmission. Transmission risk is twice from man to man. Why? Because of large area of vaginal mucosa is exposed and the large concentration of the virus in semen. So if you have a man who have get a sexually transmitted infection, for example, gonorrhea or, or prostatitis, so the semen will contain many inflammatory cells, including the lymphocytes, which harbor the virus. So this will increase, further increase the risk in comparison to man who have not got other STI. But usually man to man is high risk. Abrasions also predispose to enterovirus. Why? Because these abrasions will promote inflammations and will get more cells to the sites that are vulnerable to the entry by the virus. So abrasions also important. Teenagers and postmenopausal women are more prone because have, uh, this uh, group of uh, people have got thin mucosa and liable for abrasions. So will get more risk of transmission. And the transmission is expected to be high during the window period. Window period when the, most of the diagnostic tools are negative because of the high viral concentration. High viral concentration. The, in the window period, the patient will be asymptomatic. And the only diagnostic tool is by doing the viral load, PCR. So most of the patient will not seek medical consultation on this period. And, but unfortunately, there are the higher at higher risk for transmitting the virus to other people. So, in 
in summary, the risk of contracting HIV after exposure to infected body fluid is dependent on the integrity of the exposed site, whether it has abrasions or trauma, the type and the volume of fluid, for example, semen, and the level of viremia, for example, in the window period or at the later stages of HIV infection. In the Ajibnakum case, if you ask if you have high risk or not risk, you have to keep in your these parameters. So it depends on the integrity of the exposed site, type, and it has an other ulcerating HIV infection, if you get other STI, the volume of the fluid, man to man or woman to man, the level of viremia in the person, whether it has in the window period or on the treatment or in the later stage. These are depend on the risk of contracting HIV. So this is the summary of risk of HIV transmission after single exposure to an infected source, HIV infected patient. So vaginal intercourse, female to male, conferred 0.05%. On the contrary, male to female, female will confer 0.1%, so it's high, it's high risk. So male to male is higher risk than female to male. Blood exposure, on the contrary, 90%, confer 90% risk. Percutaneous needle injury, 0.3% around. Mother to child, vaginal delivery, 15% and breast feeding around 0.5%. While the peripartum, it may reach to 80%. We are a little bit of a little bit of a vaginal intercourse and blood exposure, very important, and the vertical one. So the anal intercourse has higher risk than vaginal intercourse, may reach to 0.5% into the receptive type. عفوا دكتور سؤال. نعم. بس المقصود بال window period ما فهمتها يعني. The window period, in during this period, the احنا راح نجي هاي ال periods, راح نجي على stages of HIV infection, the patient will complain of no symptoms, asymptomatic, despite has high viral load. So this patient will going to spread the virus rapidly to the others if the if he if he exposed to other person. Shukran, Doctor. Doctor, but sir, I'm not sure how from the female to the male or point five from the male to the female or point one or point oh five. The female, uh, if the female has the virus, if the female infected and the male is not infected, the risk is point oh five percent. While if the male is infected and the female is not infected, the risk is 0.1%. So the male will transmit the virus to female, to an infected female. The infected male, when is, uh, is going to transmit the virus to an infected female, is get 0.1%. While the female, infected female, is going to transmit the virus to an infected male, is get 0.05%. So male to female transmission is higher than female to male. Through this route, vaginal intercourse. واضح ابراهيم؟ لا دكتور هذا كمان عرفت ليش ليش يعني شنو الفرق؟ واي واي فيميل تو ميل ترانس او سوري واي ميل تو فيميل ترانسميشن از هاي بيكوز اوف لارج سيرفيس اريا اكسبوز تو ذا فيروس ذا فاجينال ميوكوزا هاز لارج سيرفيس اريا تو اكسبوز ذا ماتيريالز فروم ذا ميل ذا سيمن اوكي اون ذا كونتراري فيميل تو ميل ترانسميشن از رايت بيكوز اوف نارو Uh, site of mucosal exposed to body cervical secretions. Wallah, Nana? So the surface area is very important. Female surface area is larger than the male surface area through vaginal intercourse. Okay, so we'll go th uh, through the, the mode of a transmission that are not going to transmit the virus. For example, kissing, hugging, toilet seat, mosquitoes, bites, fleas, and other insects. Traveling, shaking hands, these are not going to transmit the virus. Bed linen, doorknobs, telephones, towels, combs, swimming pool, sharing foods, these are not going to transmit the virus. So have a, have a look on this slide. This is very important.
So we'll go through the life cycle of HIV infection. The life cycle. So each virus has a life cycle. So entry into the cell commence with binding of the GP122 to the CD4 receptor. So the main target is the CD4 receptor cells. So each cell that harbor this receptor, CD4 receptor, is going to be infected. So this is the mature virus. It's going to attach to a CD4 receptor. This is the lymphocyte receptor. After binding, it will cause a, confirm range, a confirmational change in the uh, receptor and to allow to bind to other receptor to the chemokine core receptor, CCR5 or CXCR4. This are core receptor for the entry of the virus. So a, confirm, uh, a conformational change, a, confirm, a conformational change in the GP122 that permits binding of one of two chemokinin receptors, again, CXCR4 or CCR5, after binding to the GP to the CD4 receptor. Followed by binding to this receptor, there will be membrane fusion and cellular entry involving the GP41. So after conformational change in the CCR5 or CXCR4, there will be fusion of the viral of the virus to the surface membrane of the target cells, and there will be release of the virus contents, including the viral genome. What are the cell stages? Attachment of the CD4 receptor. After that, there will be conformational change in this receptor. It will binding to the other core receptor to facilitate the entry and the fusion of the virus. So these are the first stages. So the attachment, binding, and fusion. Now in this life cycle, life cycle uh, because it has therapeutic prognostication in development of the antiviral therapy to this virus. So I am going to ask you, what about the cells that harbor CD4 cells? Do you have any idea which cells in the body that harbor this receptor, CD4 receptor? Doctor, yeah, helper one. Right, and right in the chat. Can you follow Java? Right in the chat. Come on. So key helper. Okay, key helper one. Macrophage. Okay. So after fusion, so the, the cell that harbor CD4 receptor, and again, T helper lymphocyte, the monocyte macrophage, the dendritic cells, and lastly, the microglial cells in the central nervous system. So upon, after exposure of these cells, after binding and fusion, there will be activation of the enzyme, the reverse transcription of the viral RNA genome. The viral RNA will be converted to by uh, reverse transcriptase into a double strand DNA, because the virus has an RNA virus, not DNA virus, this enzyme, the reverse transcriptase, will convert the genomic RNA into the double-stranded DNA. This double-stranded DNA is going to integrate with the host genome through an enzyme which we call it integrase inhibitors. Integrase inhibitors. Integrate, this is an enzyme, the target enzyme for drugs. We call it integrase inhibitors. So after genomic RNA uh, uh, release into the host cells, there will be reverse transcription of this genomic RNA into double-stranded DNA and is going to integrate to the host genome through the integrase enzyme. And the here, it's the virus may remain dormant. Upon activation of the cell, for, for example, by replication of the cell, or under stress of the cell, the cell, cell expo uh, exposed to stress, there will be activation of the viral genome with the division of the cell. So there will be again transcription through the viral messenger RNA. There will be synthesis of a protein that are important for the virus. Through many enzymes, including the protease enzyme, 
and there will be re-synthesis of the virus structure again. So keep in your mind that DNA produces new virons only in the host genome when only if they undergo cellular activation. So if the, if the cell undergoing active replication results in, trans, in the transcription of the viral messenger, what we call the viral messenger RNA. So the DNA produces new variants. This is the DNA of the virus. Because the, the virus has in the cell, in the cell nucleus, the DNA form, not in the RNA form. When it is integrated to the host genome. So it is near in the DNA state, not in the RNA state. So DNA produces new virus only when, if they undergo cellular activation, resulting when the cell is activated, there will be synthesis of protein. Well, how, how we can synthesize protein through the transcription of the viral messenger RNA copies, which are then translated into the viral peptides. These are the viral peptides or viral proteins. These precursor, precursor proteins will be cleaved, will be cleaved uh, by the enzyme we call it protease into new viral structural proteins and enzymes that migrate to the cell surface. So after synthesis through the messenger RNA, the viral proteins and peptides through the protease enzyme, will be bind to the surface to produce new infectious viral particles. These will bud from the cell surface and, and get the cell uh, to the host of the cell membrane to form new mature viral particles. And then the cycle will repeat itself. Keep in your mind that CD4 lymphocytes that are replicating HIV, so the CD4 that harbor the HIV, have a very short half-life, in around one day, Takribanian. So in summary, there will be attachment, binding of the virus through the receptors, core receptor and receptor, the CD4 receptor, and then fusion of the viral material into the host genome, release of the viral genome, the genomic RNA, and the enzyme reverse transcriptase, there will be conversion of the genomic RNA into the double-stranded DNA. This double-stranded DNA will, through the enzyme integrase, will be integrated into the viral genome. Upon activation of the cell, the genomic DNA will be able to synthesize viral messenger RNA. Through this viral messenger RNA, there will be synthesis of viral proteins and peptides, and these are cleaved by the protease enzyme to, uh, in order to incorporate it to the mature new viral particle, then budding of the virus from the cell surface and release into the mature viral. So these are the life cycle of the virus, and the cycle will repeat itself. I assume knowledge we have the red arrows, these are the target of the antiviral therapy, antiretroviral therapy. You have the fusion inhibitors, the receptors, the, the conversion of the reverse transcriptase from the RNA to DNA, and the integration. And lastly, the proteins through the cleavage of the polypeptides and assembly. Brief the life cycle of the virus and how to akida khatuhan details in, in virology. Yani now it come to our phone, yani the main ideas for the yani life cycle and the targets of the antiretroviral therapy. Yani we are not just antiviral, retro antiretroviral therapy. We are going to say, "Kim or kin receptor antagonist? We know what kim or kin. We know what the idea is. We know what the binding is. We know what the transcriptase or the proteins or the integrins." So these are important from the therapeutic points of view. What about the life cycle of the 
HIV infection. واضح دكتور. نعم. So the target cells by the that harbor the CD4 receptor, the microglial cell, the dendritic cell, the monocyte macrophage, the lymphocyte, and including the T helper, and including the T helper lymphocyte. Yeah, these are one. Sorry, I'm more. I'm more. Yeah, that's the T helper lymphocyte. Okay. So how the virus will affect the immune or, or destroy the immune system? by the depletion of CD4 cells. And again, the, the cells that harbor this virus are going to have short half-life. Short half-life, and it may reach in around one day. And reversing of the ratio, the normally CD4, CD8 ratio is high. So and increase the CD8 to CD4 ratio. Normally, in the person usually have CD4 to high CD4 CD4 ratio. In HIV infection, the ratio will be reversed. There will be more CD8 to CD4 ratio because of the depletion of the CD4 cells. And as a consequence, uh, consequence there will be impairment of the cell-mediated immunity and uh, followed by impairment of the humor immunity because B lymphocyte needs integration with the T helper cells to produce antibodies. And there will be persistent inflammatory process, persistent, which may, may mediate the non HIV uh, manifestations, non HIV infection manifestations of AIDS because of persistent inflammatory process. So, the main target of the HIV is going to destroy the CD4 cells, most important of which is T helper lymphocyte. It has a very important contribution in the immune system because these cells have an, an important part in the immunity, in the cell-mediated immunity and the humoral immunity. So both of them will be depleted, but in the cell-mediated immunity, more depletion. So the impact will be more on the cell-mediated immunity. What about the stages of HIV infection? We have an acute infection, clinical latency followed by AIDS. So the first stage is an acute infection. During this period, there will be large amount of the virus are being produced in the body. Then the clinical latency, this is stage of the virus, will produce at the very low levels. Why? Because there is an immune response against the virus. So in this, uh, during this stage, you may not have any symptoms. And this clinical latency has a variable period. It may reach from a few months to many years of clinical latency. And uh, during this stage, the patient may, may still have uh, going to transmit the virus to others. And the last stage is the AIDS, which is the end result of the destruction or of the immune system. So the CD4 cell will, will be very low in counts, below 200 cells per cubic millimeter. And most of the patients without the treatment will typically survive through three years without treatment. And with the treatment, it may, it may reach near normal life because of the advances of the antiretroviral therapy. So these are the main stages. We have an acute infection, clinical latency, and AIDS. Each have a different mode of transmission, of uh, presentation. In this scheme, you have to know that uh, uh, how the virus is going through the immune system in the initial first stages, which is, we call it the acute infection. The viral load will be very high. So this is the primary infection. and the virus will be transmitted and disseminated to various organs, what you call it acute HIV syndrome. Why dissemination of the virus? Seeding of lymphoid organs, the lymph node. So the uh, initial infections. The CD4 count here high. After the time, the CD4 count will be low. During acute infection, there will be depletion of the CD4s because the body has not reached the typical immune system to counteract the virus. 
After that, there will be production of the antibodies. So the, there will be a battle between the virus and the immune response. So this is here the clinical latency. The body try to suppress the viral replication. But after that, the immune response will be depleted and will be exhausted due to production of the virus. And there, after that, there will be decline in the CD4 cells and the rise up in the viral load. Till they reach the stages of the opportunistic infections followed by death. So it may take years to reach this stage. This is the natural history of the HIV infection. So followed by primary infection, acute HIV syndrome, clinical latency, then the constitutional symptoms, opportunistic disease, and death. وعبقت الله بس بالنسبة للستيجز of HIV infection and its correlation the CD4 count and the viral load now the شوفون من the opportunistic infections is begin to rise when the viral load is high and the CD4 count fall below 400 So how about the mode of presentation? The primary HIV infection or the acute HIV syndrome. So most of the patient here is symptomatic, more than 50%. And the incubation period is usually two to four weeks after exposure. So after exposure to an infected patient, the incubation period is about two to four weeks. The duration of symptoms is variable, but seldom longer than two weeks. So an average two weeks. The presentation will be similar to infectious mononucleosis, infectious mononucleosis, or the glandular fever. So what are, how the patient will present? Usually present with fever, rash, macropapular rash, sore throat, lymphadenopathy, myalgia, arthralgia, so it is resemble the infectious mononucleosis. Some patients present with diarrhea, headache, ulcerations, oral and genital ulcerations. Some patient may present with meningoencephalitis, and rarely may present with the health palsy, seventh cranial nerve palsy. <clears throat> so these are the primary. So these are not specific for any disease. Many diseases may present with these symptoms. So this infection uh, usually uh, not specific to HIV. Many diseases share this presentation. For example, infectious mononucleosis mediated by Epstein virus, CMV, uh, syphilis infection, flu-like illness, influenza may, may present with these symptoms. So transient lymphopenia, thrombocytopenia, and moderate elevation of liver enzymes are commonly present during the primary HIV infection. What about the differential diagnosis at this stage of the acute HIV infection? So epstein barr virus and CMV, these are the top list. Primary toxoplasmosis and secondary syphilis. Not the primary, the secondary syphilis may present with flu like illness, rash, and the federal part. So when I ask you about question about the differential diagnosis of acute primary HIV infection, these are the common uh, differential diagnoses. What is the differential diagnosis of HIV infection? Hey, well, I don't know. So don't talk about this right for 10 minutes. Oh, Zian, tap to those in. We'll go through the lecture, or we have a stop, brief stop. Dr. Kamil Hassan. Okay. What about the second stage to the clinical latency? The virus continues to replicate, and the person is infectious. The level of viremia post zero conversion is a predictor of the rate of decline and CD4 count. So the higher the viral load, the rapid and the more tall on the CD4 count. So the level of viremia, post zero conversion, Shunyani post zero conversion, when the, when the body mounts the antibody response to the various antigens in the virus. So post zero conversions, when we measure the level of the virus, the viremia, this is a predictor of the rate of decline. 
Yeah, when the viral load is high, so the CD5 count will be more declined rapidly. How the patient will present? Some patients may present with generalized lymphadenopathy. So most of the patient will be asymptomatic, and some patient may, may present with persistent generalized lymphadenopathy. Axil is primary infection. Usually, there will be transient lymphadenopathy. When I added a lymphadenopathy, but it's usually transient. When the patient has persistent generalized lymphadenopathy, okay, so this may have the patient clinical latency. In good generalized lymphadenopathy, more than two groups. Yeah, for example, cervical and axillary. I am a generalized lymphadenopathy. And the best cervical group, I am a generalized. So generalized cervical and axillary, cervical and inguinal, cervical and abdomen, what? The median time, so the median, not the mean, mean, the median time from the infection to the development of AIDS in adults is about nine years. So it is a long period. During this period, the patient is infectious, but is asymptomatic. Most of the patient is, are asymptomatic. So this is the stage of clinical latency. What about the minor HIV-associated disorder? These are considered minor. It may develop during the latest stage of clinical latency. So we have stage two, stage three, and category B. This and in the Shufun have two stages, and now according to the WHO and now according to the CDC, to the American uh, Central of Disease and Prevention, and this is according to the WHO. You have a look on them, and you have a look on them, and details. I am saying a minor HIV-associated disorder. These are minor disorders. For example, unexplained weight loss, recurrent upper respiratory tract infections, herpes zoster, angular chiliitis, recurrent oral ulcerations, popular prurotic eruptions, seborrheic dermatitis, and fungal nail infections. So, mm -hmm. يعني واحد يجي بالي ممكن هذا المريض عنده اتش اي في من يصير عنده مثلا ريكيرنت ابر ابر سبيتري تراكت انفكشنز اور ريكيرنت اورال السريشنز ات مين بي ذا مانيفستيشن اوف اتش اي في فور اكزامبل الدفرنشال دايجنوسيس اوف ريكيرنت اورال السريشنز يعني تعرفون شنو الدفرنشال دايجنوسيس اوف ريكيرنت اورال السريشنز انه بالفت جواب يعني دفرنشال دايجنوسيس اذا جاك مريض يقول لك انا دائما حلقي يعني يتقرع Shunu differential diagnosis of recurrent oral ulcerations. So, what is the anemia? Anemia? Which type of anemia? Doctor, iron deficiency anemia. Iron deficiency anemia will cause angular chiliitis rather than oral ulcers. Oral ulcers is unlikely due to iron deficiency anemia, but will cause angular chiliitis and glossitis rather than frank ulcerations. Other idea, other answers? Leukemia. Naam? Leukemia. Leukemia, okay. Yani, which type of leukemia? بس عادة الميوكيمم يعني ما تجي تجي اكيوت السريشن شو نسميها ميوكوزايتس ميوكوزايتس ولي بريزنت وذ مالتيبل ارسس بس اتس يوجوال نوت ريكيرنت اتس ان اكيوت ستيج اكيوت لوكيميا بعد دكتور النيوتريشن ديفيشنسي هم مرات يسويها العفو شنو نعم شنو قلت اول شيء نيوتريشن ديفيشنسي نيوتريشنال تقصد؟ ايه ايه وش تايب اوف نيوتريشن يعني؟ <تصفيق> هو بس واحد ما يسويها يعني اذا ما اكو يعني تغذيه قليله اللي كانت للبيشنت امم يعني بعد اكو اني ايديا اوتوميون ديزيز هم ما يسويها يعني يس فيري جود اوتوميون ديزيز ذيس از ا جود انسر وش تايب اوف اوتوميون ديزيز دو يو نو؟ لا بس يعني اعتقد بصوره عامه يعني ادري بان الاوتوميون ديزيز هم يسويها يس يو ار رايت موست كمان از لوباس سيستمك لوباس اريثروماتوسيس And vasculitis group, for example, Behjet disease. 
may present with recurrent oral ulcerations. So recurrent ulcer may be lehjet, may be uh, systemic lupus, inflammatory bowel disease, for example, Crohn's disease, mohatuable pathology, Crohn's may cause oral ulcerations, semi aphthous ulcerations. And sometimes idiopathic aphthous ulcer may cause recurrent oral ulcers. Idiopathic aphthous ulcer. It may be an infectious ulcer, for example, you know, with an infectious recurrent ulcer common. And other than HIV, is uh, a common population recurrent oral ulcers? Infectious. The herpes? Yes, herpes, recurrent herpes simplex. For other causes, uh, then celiac disease may cause recurrent oral ulcers. So one of the differential diagnoses of these recurrent oral ulcers, recurrent oral ulcerations, one of the differential is minor HIV disorder. After all of these are excluded, you have to send the patient to serology for HIV. Seborrheic dermatitis is common during HIV infections. So usually these patients present to the dermatologist. If it is refractory and recurrent, you may have to send the patient for HIV serology. Fungal man infections also common, and etc. The third stage with a profound immune suppression, there will be severe weight loss, chronic diarrhea, persistent fever, persistent oral candidiasis. These are recurrent, nana has a persistent oral candidiasis. Oral hair leukoplakia, which is virtually pathognomonic of HIV infection, pulmonary TB, severe bacterial infections, acute necrotizing infections in Al-Hasir, more recurrent necrotizing infection involving the mouth, the gingiva, the periodontal area. Anemia and chronic thrombocytopenia. So these are the stages where, where, where more profound immune suppressions, the normal manifestation will be more severe and persistent. On the other hand, these are the manifestations by the CDC uh, category. Bacillary angiomatosis, in Kunmam with Kuranam, like Kuranam, all of Bacillary angiomatosis, or Funadan Mora, Bacillary angiomatosis. This is the Katsi crash disease that is what we call it in the HIV infection. So this is not going to occur in patient with immune competent patient, but in patient that advise HIV infection, there will be Bacillary angiomatosis. And other than him, show for the incompetent patient, the show for one will HIV patient, new compromised patient. There will be bacillary angiomatosis. I follow up with you. And the answer will be incompetent patient. And cardiac crash disease, other than present with you know fever or local lymphadenopathy after a crash by a cat. But in a patient HIV infection, a crash by this animal, there will be bacillary angiomatosis. <coughs> Herpes zoster is also common during HIV infection, especially in the later stages. And it involves two distinct episodes and more than one dermatome. And in other than herpes zoster, in Shufoin, one dermatome. An immune competent or slightly immune compromised patient. But in HIV, in advanced HIV infection, if you see patient, Herpes zoster involving more than one dermatome, you have to screen it for HIV because it is unusual presentation in immune competent patient when the herpes zoster involve more than one dermatome. We have to learn the principle of herpes zoster and the stages of HIV infection. We have to learn minor disorder, not okay. These are minor disorder. راح نعيد هنا ستيج 2 يعني هذا فقط حتى تكون خلاص صوره واضحه راح نعيد ستيج 2 ستيج 3 ان ستيج 3 ذيس بيكم يونيفرسال برزنتيشن يو شو ادفانس اتش اي في انفكشن بيرسيستنت اورال كانديداس اند اورال هير اورال هيري لوكوبليك ذيس ار فيري كومن ديورينغ ذيس ستيج 3 سو these are usually become persistent and universal among patients with stage 3 HIV infections. But in stage 3, usually the patient either have persistent oral candidiasis or oral hairy leukopiaki. 
but most of them are common. So, what about the symptomatic HIV infections, either minor, or AIDS? Maybe acute HIV infection, clinical latency, will be more and more asymptomatic, then AIDS, the patient will become symptomatic. When the patient becomes symptomatic, either have minor symptoms or the AIDS-defining illness. What about the AIDS, the acquired immune deficiency syndrome? This syndrome will last months or even years, during which the patient is severely immune compromised and is susceptible to various infections, usually leading to death. And you know, one of the most common of death causes in, among AIDS patients is you know, infection, opportunistic infection, for example, pulmonary tuberculosis. So during AIDS, the patient will be severely immune compromised and susceptible to various infections. And there will be advanced immune depletion, the CD4 count usually below 200 mm. So what about the case definition? How we can diagnose AIDS? There will be CD4 count less than 200 mm plus development of specific opportunistic infections or tumors. So when a patient with HIV will have CD4 count 200 mm, and we see a certain opportunistic infection or a tumor, we, we call it AIDS patient. So there will be specific of one opportunistic infection, specific opportunistic infection, or specific tumors to define AIDS. Bob Hassel, as well as the case definition of AIDS, so we have CD4 count plus development of specific. So we have a lab test plus clinical presentation. What about the AIDS-defining diseases? the AIDS-defining diseases? Esophageal candidiasis. Like a CD4 count below 200 mm plus esophageal candidiasis, there will be this AIDS-defining disease. Cryptococcus. Cryptosporidiosis. Cerebral toxoplasmosis. More toxoplasmosis. So that should be cerebral toxoplasmosis. So this will be an AIDS. Mycobacterial infections. If I can see D4 count less than 200 mol. Pneumocystis pneumonia. Pneumocystis pneumonia. Cytomegalovirus disease outside the liver, spleen, and nose. For example, CMV colitis. When the CD4 count below 200 mol and the patient has got CD, CMV colitis, this is an AIDS defining illness. Progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. This is an AIDS defining illness. Invasive cervical carcinoma. This is an age-defining illness of the CD4 count at down 200 mm. Kaposi sarcoma, which is diagnostic of HIV infection, Kaposi. Lymphoma, either cerebral or BCL non-Hodgkin lymphoma. For a patient with HIV have gut lymphoma, if it's a cerebral or BCL non-Hodgkin lymphoma, it is an age-defining illness. Or nephropathy, if the patient has gut nephropathy, proteinuria, and symptomatic, it will be an AIDS defining illness. Or symptomatic HIV associated cardiomyopathy. So these are the AIDS defining diseases. Very important, these are the AIDS defining diseases. You have to recall these. Uh, uh, diseases in order to diagnose an AIDS patient. Yeah, mukala HIV and mana AIDS. An HIV patient, man, uh, if he didn't harbor any of these diseases, we call this an HIV infection. We call this an HIV infection. But if he harbor one of these categories of infection, we call it AIDS. So an HIV infection not equal to AIDS. زين دكتور عادي اكو ايدز بس ماكو ذني لا بغا العفو سؤال شنو دكتور يعني عادي اكو واحد عنده كل مصاب بالايدز بس ما عنده ذني لا بغا يعني بعد ما صار عنده نعم يسر احنا قلنا diagnostic criteria of AIDS we have to fulfill these uh, definitions CD4 count less than 200 plus development either opportunistic infection HNA, TB or tumor زي شوفون ذني 
يعني ذني أنا مو كل الانفكشنز sometimes malignancies sometimes infections يعني إذا جاك واحد CD4 count مالته less than 200 وعنده مثلاً cerebral toxoplasm this is an AIDS patient which is the end spectrum of the HIV infection واضح إبراهيم؟ واضح دكتور اكو سؤال لحد الان بالنسبه للايدز ديفايننج ديزيزز اوكي سو ويل جو ثرو ذا دايجنوسيس اوف ذا اتش اي في انفكشن ذا افيلبل تيست فور ذا دايجنوسيس اوف اتش اي في انفكشن انكلودينج ذوز ذات كان ديتكت ذا اتش اي في انتي بوديز مثل ايلايزا اتش اي في 1 فور اتش اي اتش اي في 2 ديفرنشيشن اسيز And by these tests, we can't differentiate whether the patient has HIV-1 or HIV-2 by the ELISA or by the Western blood. So by either ELISA or Western blood, we can't differentiate HIV-1 from HIV-2. So we call it differentiation assay. The HIV antibody and antigen is a combination immunoassay. So we have in this test, we know the antibody and the antigen, the HIV antigen and the antibody at the same time. Combination immunoassay. These are the normal and semi differentiation immunoassay. We can differentiate HIV one from HIV two, or just HIV antigen alone, or the HIV RNA alone. Either qualitative, يعني شو يطلع لنا الviral load, or sorry, either positive or negative qualitative, or quantitative. لحين نعطينا الviral load شو كده. فاحنا antibody, antigen, or the viral RNA genome. What about the immunoassays for the antibodies? Either point of care test, high موجودة عادة يعني يشبه الكاسيت شون التروبونين or the COVID-19 kit إذا شايفي هذا نسمي just drop of blood راح يطلع الرزالت رأسا خلال 10 minutes or the laboratory sophisticated test ELISA test Keep in your mind that a positive antibody test from two different immunoassays يعني for example rapid point of care test plus ELISA is sufficient to confirm the infection. يعني لما المريض جانا عند ال point of care test positive, we have to do it by ELISA test in order to diagnose them with positive infection. In respect to the antibodies, طبعا هذا نحتاج two tests. أما ال point of care test or the ELISA test, combine both of them will result in HIV infection positive. So this is the summary of the diagnosis. Uh, nowadays, we reach the fourth generation immunoassay for the diagnosis of HIV infection. These are very accurate tests. So, if, if a patient uh, we diagnose immunoassay positive, we have to do the HIV1, HIV2 antibody differentiation immunoassay to differentiate whether the patient has HIV1 or HIV2. Either one of them positive or negative, so it will result in the diagnosis of HIV infection 1 or HIV infection 2. Both of them positive, the patient have infected in both HIV 1 and HIV 2 infection. This patient most of them will result in rapid progression of the disease if, if they get both of these viruses. Especially occur in multiple partner patients. They will get both uh, viruses, HIV 1 and HIV 2. Negative tests will exclude the by fourth generation immunoassay will exclude the infection. This is regarding the immunoassay. But when the, when the HIV, uh, HIV-1, HIV-2 antibody differentiation immunoassay, negative or intermediate, negative, يعني طلع positive by immunoassay, fourth generation immunoassay, طلع positive, لكن the differentiation immunoassay طلع negative, يعني طلع عنا positive with immunoassay, Combination immunoassay طلع positive لكن differentiation immunoassay طلع negative يعني positive with negative بالحالة شو حنسوي viral RNA راح نسوي PCR for viral RNA إذا طلع negative exclude طبعا ال RNA for HIV1 إذا طلع positive this is an acute HIV infection واضح هسه يعني شو بتنسوي ال PCR for RNA إذا طلع ال combination immunoassay positive لكن الديفرنشيشن ميونو اسي نيجاتيف 
يعني الفيرال ماتيريالز موجوده بس لكن انتي بودي كانوت ديفرنشيت بين اتش اي في ان اتش اي في 2 او انترميديت لانه الحاله ايش حنسوي بي سي ار واضح طلاب بالنسبه فور ذيس سكيم فور دايجنوستس اوف اتش اي في انفكشن ذيس از فيري امبورتنت دكتور زين دو ار كاتب سو فحص لو بوزيتيف بالنسبه للاكيوت اتش اي في 1 لو نيجاتيف بالنسبه اتش اي في 1 اتش اي في 2 1 هذا يعتمد على هذا الماتيريال هذا البي سي ار هذا اكو بي سي ار احنا عاده هذا فور اتش اي في ذيس از بي سي ار فور ار ان بي سي ار فور ار ان اي فور اتش اي في 1 اكو انذر سامبل لازم نسوي بي سي ار فور اتش اي في 2 هذا عاده نوت افيلبل يعني مو كل اللابس تشتغل صراحة. احنا عادنا الاكثر واحد عندنا حتى ان يراك هو البي سي ار 4 اتش اي في 1 نوت ذا اتش اي في 2. اوكي. زين دكتور هذا طلع لنا مثلا بالار ان اي طلع نيجاتيف نيجاتيف وبالاخر شو سوى انا سوينا الار ان اي طلع لنا نيجاتيف فور اتش اي في 1 معنا نقول هذا اتش اي في 2. لا مو احنا سوينا بوكت هذا احنا سوينا الاتش اي في ميون ديفرنش اذا طلع نيجاتيف راح نسوي اذا طلع نيجاتيف طبعا البي سي ار فور اتش اي في 1 يو ماي جو يو ماي جو يو ماي جو ثرو ذا بي سي ار فور اتش اي في 2 طبعا ذس ويل اكسكلود اتش اي في 1 بس نوت اتش اي في 2 واضح؟ يعني اذا طلع البي سي ار نيجاتيف ويل اكسكلود شنو؟ اكيوت اتش اي في انفكشن فور تايب 1 نوت تايب 2 تمام دكتور. بعد اكو سؤال؟ شفتوا هسه الدايجرام كلكم؟ يعني ما عندكم سؤال عليه حاليا؟ لا 